Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again today. Welcome to Worship and the Word with us here at Church of the True Vine. May God bless you today as we spend this time together in the presence of Jesus. I'm going to begin by reading from God's Word. I'm going to read Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. What wonderful, wonderful promises in God's word of God's keeping power over our lives. He is so wonderful and so full of love towards his people. We give him all praise. We give him all glory today. And you know, the Lord is watching over Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. And as you know, every week we pray for those who suffer simply because they are followers of Jesus Christ. Today, we're praying for believers in the nation of Malaysia. I'm going to read to you from the Open Doors World Watchlist booklet. If you don't have a copy, please get in touch with Open Doors and they will send you a copy for free. It's a wonderful resource to be able to pray for the persecuted church. But this is what it says about Malaysia. In Malaysia, the government monitors churches and it is illegal to share the gospel with Malay Muslims. Converts from Islam to Christianity experience the most persecution as every ethnic Malay is expected to be Muslim. These believers are often forced to hide their faith and meet in secret. If discovered, they could face rejection from their spouse and family and even be sent to a re-education camp. Anyone who leaves Islam to become a Christian isn't just going against Malaysia's constitution, but against society at large, pitting believers against their own community. So please join with us later on as we pray for believers in Malaysia. Now let's turn our attention to worshipping him, giving Jesus our praise, our adoration. And we're going to sing today a beautiful, beautiful old hymn. And I want to thank Emu Music for releasing this absolutely beautiful arrangement that they have released for churches to use in live streaming. We're going to sing together, My Song is Love Unknown. God bless you as we worship Jesus today.
Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the privilege that is ours to pray for fellow Christians around the world who are paying such a price for their faith in you. Today we pray for Malaysia and all those who are suffering on so many levels for belief in you. We ask, Lord, that you will bless them in ways that you see that they need in their business life, their family life, their church life. We ask that there will be an increase to the kingdom of heaven in these coming days in Malaysia. We pray, Lord, that you would break down all the strongholds that come against the name of Jesus and your people in that country. We ask, Lord, that in spite of all the persecutions, we pray that your kingdom will come and show the way to eternal life is in Jesus alone. Jesus is the way, the only way to heaven. And we pray that all deception, masquerading as truth, will be play, replaced by a powerful demonstration of the Spirit's power throughout that country. We ask, Lord, that the latter days of this country will be more blessed than ever before and that there will be a great harvest of believers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm reading today from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, beginning at verse 8, where Jesus says this, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner. Who repents? This parable, the parable of the lost coin, as it is known, comes between two other parables concerning things which are lost. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep, where one sheep has wandered off, and so the shepherd leaves the 99 securely in the sheepfold while he goes off to look for the other sheep. And then there is great rejoicing when he comes back carrying that sheep which is lost. And then after the parable of the lost coin, Jesus tells the, the better known parable, the one which we would probably all go to, which is the parable of the prodigal son, where the son gets his inheritance, demands his inheritance from his father, in fact, and goes off to spend it all on just living life and having a riotous life and, and, and so on, but ends up deserted, 
he ends up starving and he begs a local farmer to allow him to feed the pigs the ultimate degradation for a jewish boy to be feeding the pigs and he's so hungry he's longing to eat what he is giving to the pigs but then he returns home uh, and, and he's saying, look, just make me like one of your hired men. I don't deserve anything. I'm the one who's blown it. But the father's response is so wonderful. The father just throws his arms around him and he and he puts the robe on him and he puts the ring on his finger and he says, let's get the fatted calf. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. This son of mine was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost. He is found. A wonderful, wonderful response from the father, simply welcoming that son in because he is so overjoyed that his son who was lost has returned home. And in between these two parables is this parable, the parable of the lost coin. Now, the thing about all three of these parables is that Jesus told them in response to something that was going on. And we find that at the beginning of the chapter, Luke 15, beginning at verse one, says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him and the Pharisees and scribes complained saying this man receives sinners and eats with them and in response to what the scribes and the pharisees are saying jesus tells these three parables about things which are lost now we can see that if a sheep goes missing a sheep is very valuable to a shepherd and so you can see that he would go looking for that lost sheep. You could see why it was so important to look for a lost sheep. You can see why a son is so important to the father. But we see simply in, in the parable of the lost coin, it says, What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, will not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And it's very easy to look at that and think, so what's the big deal? It's a coin. It's just one coin. What's the big deal? You know, it's 5p, it's 10p, maybe it's 50p if it's a silver coin, but it's really not a big deal. When we look at the sort of things that go on in people's lives today, if you lose 50p, it's not really a big deal. If you lose 5p, it's even less of a deal. And so we can kind of almost move on from this, this, uh, this parable because we think, don't quite get it. But the thing about this, is that we have to understand Jesus told these parables to a Jewish audience. He was not speaking this to Gentiles and actually he was speaking this to a Jewish audience 2000 years ago. He was speaking into the culture of the day. He was speaking into things that people knew at that time. So to really understand what is so key about this parable, we have to understand what Jesus is speaking in two. And the clue comes when it says, what woman having 10 silver coins? That is not just a random number picked out. When a woman in ancient Israel got married, one of the things that her father would do for her would be to give her a headdress. And on that headdress was sewn 10 silver coins. So this headdress was the last thing that her father would give her before a woman got married. So obviously it would have massive sentimental value. This is the last thing her father has given her. But more than that, this formed part of the dowry that the father gave to his daughter when she got married. And it was 10 silver coins that were attached to this headdress. That dowry was given in case that couple ever got into financial difficulties. It was given almost as an insurance policy about anything that might happen. But the problem is that if the, 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 the coins were missing from that, then it said to everybody else who could see that woman wearing that headdress, they've fallen into financial difficulty. It was a, something which could bring great shame, great disgrace 
upon her husband because a Jewish husband was expected to provide for his wife and his family. It was considered a terrible thing, almost a curse, if he was not able to provide for his family. And so this woman in the parable, she has 10 coins, but she's lost one. She's lost one. Can you imagine what must be going on in her mind? She's thinking, what are people going to think? People are going to think that my husband cannot provide. People are going to think that I've had to use one of these 10 coins to be able to buy food. One of those coins was the equivalent of a whole day's wages. And she's thinking, people are going to believe that my husband cannot provide and I've had to use that coin to buy food. What a terrible disgrace this is going to bring upon my husband. Can you see now why this coin is so important? It's not important just because it's a coin. It's an important because, number one, it has the sentimental value that her father gave it to her. It's that last memory of her father. And even when her father died, she still had that headdress as something to remember her father by. But also because when that coin is missing, it means that people are going to think that her husband is not doing his job as a husband and he is not providing for his wife and his family. And therefore, there is great disgrace. So this woman is not prepared to stop at anything. She gets a lamp. She lights the house. She sweeps the house. She is thorough in looking for this coin. You can see it in her mind. I'm not stopping until I have found that coin. I know it's got to be here somewhere. I've got to find that coin. I'm not going to lose that memory of my father and I'm not going to bring disgrace upon my husband. I am finding that coin. There is a determination to make sure that she has that coin restored to herself so that it can be put back into the headdress and therefore everything is going to be okay again. There's a real determination. This is not just a haphazard, oh well, if I find it, I find it. If I don't, it's no big deal. She is not going to stop until she has found that coin. Now, why is that so important in the context in which this parable is told? Remember, the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining because tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear what he was saying, to hear Jesus' teaching. Throughout Jesus' ministry, people would come to Jesus from all sorts of backgrounds, prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. Even Gentiles would come to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, every single time, they would complain, why are you allowing these people to associate with you? When the woman comes to Simon's house and, and worships at his feet and she pours that oil upon him and she, and she dries his feet with her tears. And, and the Pharisee who is Jesus' host is thinking, well, if this man really were a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman she is. They were judging everyone. They were saying, these people do not deserve to be in the presence of the righteous. These people don't deserve to hear what this man has to say. Why is this man allowing him, allowing them anywhere near him? Why is he associating with them? The problem for the Pharisees and the scribes is that they do not see the value of these people. They valued people for whether they were righteous. They valued people for whether they were conforming to the law of Moses. And so there were certain people that they thought were beneath them, beneath the law of Moses, beneath the things of God. They could never be welcomed by God. They were detritus. They were just people who could be dismissed, people who could be, if you like, thrown away and ignored. But Jesus tells these three parables to the Pharisees and the scribes. And he says, you have got to understand this. You have got to understand the value that God places on every single life. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes on one occasion? He said, it's not the, it's not the well 
who need a doctor. It's the sick who need a doctor. In the same way, God is calling sinners to repent. He hasn't just come for the righteous. He's come for everyone. And it's sinners who need a saviour. It's sinners who need to be saved. It's sinners who need to be redeemed. God places such value on the life of those who some people would seek to disregard. Those who we would regard as lost. Jesus says in Luke 19 and verse 10 in response to Zacchaeus a tax collector welcoming Jesus into his home. He says, the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus was somebody who was lost. The tax collectors, the sinners were prostitutes. They were all people who recognized they were lost. They needed a savior. But Jesus has good news for anyone who feels they are lost, for anyone who feels they're not worthy of the kingdom of God, for anyone who feels that God would have nothing to do with them. You know, you hear people say, well, yes, I would follow Jesus, but what would Jesus want to do with me? Look at me. Look at what I have done. Look at what I have become. I have sold my body for sex. I have stolen from people. I have done terrible things. I've murdered. I've raped. I've done all these appalling things. What would God have to do with me? Why would God even want me anywhere near him? And many people out there think of themselves in that way. You are lost to all intents and purposes. But the good news is that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I want you to know something today. God does not disregard you. God does not say, well, because of what you've done, I'm not interested. Because of what you've done, you have to keep away from me. Jesus says in these parables that God sets a value on what is lost. And in this parable, the parable of the lost coin, the woman is determined to find that coin. And she will not rest until she has found that coin and recovered that coin. The good news for you today is that Jesus will not stop until he has found you and recovered you. And the good news for you today is that if that is you that this is speaking to, and you are watching this broadcast, you are watching this video, then Jesus has found you today and he is calling you to himself he says don't worry about that sin don't worry about the things that you have done why because when I came I came not only to seek but I came to save that which was lost Jesus has found you today if you are watching this so how did Jesus save you 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says that God made him who had no sin, that is Jesus, to be made sin for us. Jesus, when he went to the cross, didn't do that just so people can wear a nice piece of jewellery of cross. Jesus went to the cross so that he could save that which was lost. How did he do that? By becoming sin for us. When Jesus was nailed to that cross, everything of our sin, everything of the curse that was upon our lives was placed upon Jesus. He willingly took that burden of sin, that debt of sin that we owed upon himself and allowed God, his father, to punish him. To punish our sin in Jesus' own body. He bore all our sin. He bore all our shame. He bore all our sickness. He bore every vile thing that we have ever done. He bore every vile thing we have ever thought. He bore every vile thing we have ever said. And he bore every vile thing that has ever been done to any one of us. He took it all. He took the punishment for it all. And he put it to death on the cross but then three days later he rose again 
from the dead. He had dealt with sin once and for all. If he hadn't dealt with sin once and for all, he would never have been able to rise from the dead because Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. If Jesus had not dealt with sin once and for all, having been made to be sin for us, then he would still have been in the tomb today. But he dealt with sin completely and he is risen from the dead. And those who believe in Jesus receive everlasting life in him. We are raised from the dead in him. And the wonderful, wonderful news is that when we come to Christ, when we repent of our sin, when we say, Jesus, will you forgive even me? Will you be my Lord? Will you save me today? If you will cry out to God and mean it with all your heart, then Jesus will save you right now. There's nothing that will stop Jesus from saving you if you will call upon him, if you will turn away from your sin and choose to follow him. He will save you right this moment. Simply call upon his name. Jesus, I am a sinner. I need to be saved. But Jesus, you are the son of God who went to the cross for me and was made sin for me. Jesus Thank you for the cross. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to wash me clean. I ask you to make me new. And I ask you to raise me to eternal life in you. Jesus, save me now, I pray. If you have prayed that, if you have cried out to God with all your heart and you have meant it, then Jesus has saved you even now. And you receive the gift of everlasting life and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the third person of the Godhead himself who comes to dwell inside you and enable you to live the life that God always intended for you to live. A life of peace, a life of joy, a life of righteousness and a life that is pleasing to God. If you've prayed that prayer, then there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. That's what it says in the parable. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Listen, the rejoicing is in the presence of the angels of God. So who's the one doing the rejoicing? It's God himself is rejoicing as you give your life to Christ. So God bless you today. If you have prayed that prayer and you have meant it with all your heart, you are now a child of God, beloved and accepted in Christ. If you have prayed that prayer, then please get in touch. We would love to be able to pray with you, to help you, to support you and to encourage you in whatever way we can as you begin this new life in Christ Jesus. If you don't have a Bible, then I would encourage you to get hold of one. Get a translation that you find easy to read. Many people will use the New International Version. Some people will use the Good News Bible. I personally use a New King James Bible. But get a Bible that is easy for you to read, that you can understand. And begin reading Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels. They will tell you who Jesus is, what he has done for you and what he is like what God is like. If you can't get hold of a physical Bible, but you have an Android or an iPhone, then you can download a Bible app and you can begin to read it in that way. If you're not anywhere near where we are in Clevedon, then please find a local church and go along and they will welcome you. They will love you and they will help you. They will encourage you. But if you are in the Clevedon area and you you have prayed that prayer and you want to know more about following Jesus, then please come along and visit us. We meet at Clevedon Community Centre on Prince's Road every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. Or you can contact us. Use the contact details on the website. The details will be on the screen at the end. We're back again at the same time next week, 10 a.m. here on YouTube for another Worship and the Word. Until then. God bless you. Bye-bye.